हेलो फ्रेंड्स सो कंटिन्यूइंग विद द इंटीग्रेटेड सेशन फॉर योर नेक्स्ट लेवल प्रिपरेशन एज प्रोमिस्ड वी आर कमिंग अप विद द मैक्सिमम इंटीग्रेशन आई हैड सेड दैट आई विल ट्राई टू इंटीग्रेट द ऑफथेल्मोलॉजी विद द मैक्सिमम सब्जेक्ट्स एंड सी टुडे आई हैव कॉट होल्ड ऑफ डॉक्टर प्रवीण दैट प्लीज सर बिकॉज वन ऑफ द वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट्स अबाउट अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट ट्यूमर दैट इज रेटिनोब्लास्टोमा इज इट्स जेनेटिक्स सो आई सर्टेनली वांटेड टू bring that in front of you um, as you know that um, retinoblastoma is the most common primary intraocular malignant tumor and uh, it is a very uh, common tumor that uh, we are seeing nowadays in the children so we'll be talking today about some of the pathological aspects as well as clinical aspects of the retinoblastoma this uh, carcinoma is more commonly found in the small children as uh, we have seen that there is no gender preponderance and it was the first carcinoma that was known to be associated with the genetic abnormality now though the most common age of diagnosis is less than 3 years as we already uh, have discussed in the class that 1 and a half of year child is the usual presentation that we are getting in the uh, in the opds so first i would like to uh, uh, ask sir please show us about the genetic abnormalities and how the gene mutations are actually responsible for causing this retinoblastoma right uh, so friends what happens is retinoblastoma as you know it comes from a retinoblasts so the previous concept was that retinoblast are a type of cells which can differentiate into both the layers of the neurons and the glial cells right now what the concept has changed they now say it is coming from the retinal progenitors that means those cells which can basically give rise to neurons so retinoblastoma is a tumor which is called as primitive neuro ectodermal tumor i hope friends you might remember some tumors like uh, Ewing sarcoma, which is one of the most best known uh, a, a, a peanut, it's called primitive neuroendocrine neuroectodermal tumor. It's called Ewing sarcoma. So basically, what happens is these tumors are a small round cell tumors. What is common about all of them is that they belong to a family of Ewing sarcoma family tumor, that is called peanut. So this tumor, retinoblastoma, we all know it's coming from a gene called as RB gene. now uh, ma'am what happened was the gene genes rb gene was discovered first and the okay. entire neoplasia was believed to be originating from the discovery of this rb gene okay and uh, rb gene basically it's a type called as governor of proliferation now well, you'll be surprised to know that some uh, names are there very commonly used like one of them is polisma the p53 yes yes then came the guardian p53 okay and this is called as governor governor so i'll just tell you like avoid it is called as governor this is a very interesting name what happened was see uh, rb gene as such it always remains in its hypophosphorylated state that that state it's active form so we can say the active form of this rb gene is in the hypo state okay hypophosphorylated state to what the reason of this is it always contains a protein called as e2f there's a pocket here and has a elongation factor 2 this e2f is always linked to the rb gene but whenever there is a growth factor suppose there is activation of cyclin cyclin d and say cdk4 which you remember are the cell cycle proliferators the cyclin d and cdk4 this causes this rb gene to lose the e2f so what happens this rb gene will add many phosphate groups to it and because of the addition of this phosphate groups this unique protein called as e2f it becomes free this e2f elongation factor 2 it becomes free now this e2f is the basic reason what causes the cell proliferation this will lead to activation of some other cyclins they activate they activate other cyclins like the cyclin e and the cyclin a and if you remember friends these cyclins are not the cell cycle inhibitors the cyclins basically are the cell cycle proliferators so cyclin e this will proliferate the g1 s phase they will proliferate right and the cyclin e will proliferate the g2 m phase so what is so unique about it rb gene is a governor of proliferation so it is trying to tell you see suppose this cell cycle proliferator cyclin d and cdk they have to cause proliferation they have to first go through the governor they have to take the permission of the governor so this is the governor governor says i will not cause proliferation unless unless you make me inactive 
okay so the, this is the active form and the question often asked in pathology is which form is active form often students get confused why are we calling this hypophosphate state as active form because you see rb basically is what it's a tumor suppressor gene the normal function of the rb gene is to suppress a tumor so in this form it is basically able to suppress it and this governor when it is basically inactivated it is now causing proliferation the governor becomes inactive he says okay now you can cause proliferation the whole thing is happening because of some cell cycle proliferators which in this case is cyclin d and cdk4 let's assume there is some mutation of the rbg mutation of rbg means now this governor is no longer there he is no longer there that means the active form is no longer there the rbg is always getting inactive a uh, inactive rb gene does not hold e2f elongation factor 2 and the e2f has now got a full freedom let's cause proliferation at g1s and let's cause proliferation at g2m so that is what is the basic problem of rb the rb in its active form withholds proliferation the rb in its inactive form causes proliferation so inactive form of rb gene becomes a mutated form of rb gene now holding on to this let's understand the genes and the inheritance patterns a very interesting phenomenon it was discovered by nutson this yes. uh, the scientist nutson what he said was that rb mutation may be inherited or may be acquired yes so what he believed was that uh, there are some unfortunate children who would get inheritance from their parents so he called them familial form okay and he said that out of the see rb is a gene right so this gene will have two alleles yes so if one of the alleles is mutated right before the birth so obviously let's see this mutation so one of the allele is mutated even before birth that means this birth is happening in the heterozygous form right mm -hmm. now after birth if suppose the second allele is also getting mutated now the person is having a homozygous rb gene but you know ma'am this second mutation occurs only in the retinal cells only it does not happen in the entire body okay so whereas the entire person body has the heterozygous form on retinal cells has a homozygous form and that is the reason we say it to be autosomal dominant inheritance okay uh, many times you may be asked ma'am that uh, ma'am the tumor is occurring in a homozygous form because both the alleles are getting mutated mm -hmm. so why are we calling this autosomal dominant the reason is the second mutation occurs only in the retinal cells not in the entire body so this is a unique i think this happens. is a very important point which could be asked in a form of it has been asked in multiple times in usmle and we are waiting for the next exam to start <laughs> and we'll keep on proliferating this 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 question will keep this on is a must be for the next exam exactly. a must ask question i think okay the entire body is heterozygous form only the retinal cells are homozygous form and that is the reason precise reason why we call this autosomal dominant inheritance pattern but however if you look at this in sporadic form in sporadic what happens the allele they are normal at the birth form normal at the birth form so two of the mutations occurs after birth right so in femoral form one mutation has occurred in the zygote form second occurs during the lifetime in the sporadic form none of the mutation occurs at birth both of them occur after the birth form and that is called a sporadic form in this uh, i think we ma'am will tell you that the femoral form is mostly bilateral cases and the sporadic form is usually unilateral cases yeah. yes so mm -hmm. sir uh, beautiful you fully explained i think uh, about the natson uh, hypothesis uh, i would like uh, you to confirm that how many cases do we get uh, in total for bilaterality because in ophthalmology this question is a very frequent one right. so what uh, what should uh, the student mark because they are giving like 15 to 20 20 to 25 25 to 30 or 30 to 35 uh, right. so so what happens is the final cases are usually bilateral and if it is asked what percentage of familial cases are bilateral is 90 percent 90 percent of the familial, familial cases, cases are bilateral. bilateral okay sporadic cases are usually unilateral yes but because the sporadic cases are more common so we would say the overall bilateral yes. becomes less it comes out on to 25 to 40 percent okay so somewhere between 25 30 or 35 40, yes. 40 up to tw from 25 to 40 whatever is the figure given that so overall should, overall it should be the number of bilateral cases because uh, actually in the last we have to solve the mcqs yes, right, correct, so that is very very important that the student should not get confused that how much amount of bilateral cases so as sir has said between 25 to 40 whatever is your figure you should go for it 
ओके सो लेट्स लुक फॉर सम ऑफ द क्लिनिकल इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग्स दैट आई वॉन्ट टू टेल यू लाइक द एसोसिएटेड ट्यूमर्स नाउ अ डेज वी आर हैविंग सो मेनी रेडिएशन ऑल्सो सर एंड दैट इज वाई वी आर नॉट प्रेफरिंग द सी टी स्कैन इवन फॉर द डायग्नोसिस दो कैल्सिफिकेशन इज अ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट पार्ट ऑफ दिस रेटिनो ब्लास्टोमा एंड एवरीबडी नोज द सी टी स्कैन इज बेटर फॉर दिस पॉइंटिंग आउट द कैल्सिफिकेशन बट वी आर नॉट सेंडिंग बिकॉज इवन रेडियो colleges are uh, discouraging us not to send the babies for the ct scan as it can cause the uh, the uh, tumors also so now sir we have got two tumors one which is associated with the retinoblastoma while the baby is having retinoblastoma that is with tumor and that is actually pinealoblastoma now uh, because uh, the hindu mythology used to say that uh, this pineal gland is considered to be the third eye yeah. third eye so that is why it is also called as trilateral retinoblastoma so don't get confused we have got two eyes only and usually we have bilateral retinoblastoma only but because this pineal gland was considered to be the third eye so in that cases it is also called as trilateral retinoblastoma now there is one more important thing and that usually confuses the students when they say most common tumor associated with the retinoblastoma and they usually their prompt answer is osteo sarcoma but actually it is not the most common tumor associated with retinoblastoma is pinealoblastoma but if they say that when the patient is disease free now that term is very very important if the patient is disease free he is now being given the treatment of retinoblastoma what is the most common tumor that can occur in that baby that is actually osteosarcoma because uh, sir what happens actually they play with the words and mcq is just playing with the words let's let's understand this very uh, in a in a more conceptual way ma'am yeah. see what happens is uh, the patients who are having bilateral retinoblastoma mm -hmm. like those are the feminal cases yes yes so in that case usually you will see a case also having a sum of the retinoblasts that is a tumor cells on the pineal glands that means yes. the feminal cases usually have a pineoblastoma yes that is the reason i am said that those patients who have ordered a blastoma they will have a pineoblastoma yes but understand it's a very important fact to understand ma'am that retinal blastoma rbg in as such controls various organs yes it is a governor proliferation i understood but mm. it causes cell proliferation mm -hmm. so rbg in as such will cause multiple organ uh, control in control of that so why does rbg in causes mutation causes only retinal blastoma or maybe osteosarcoma the one of the reason that uh, pathology says is that the bone as such has many other genes which can control it okay one of them is rbg retina cells however have only one gene which can control this that is retinal blastoma okay it is other way around other way around, other way around. so therefore as ma'am said the disease free may it is osteosarcoma, osteosarcoma. however if a person ha person has a retinal blastoma it should be pineoblastoma so i hope now it will be better for you to remember because recall obviously is better when we no, understand it, where the conceptual yes sir okay now uh, look for the four stages usually the intraocular tumors go through the stages so like for malignant melanoma also for the retinoblastoma we have got four stages now these kind of tumors are in the beginning they are asymptomatic so they are causing more of signs and uh, as we know so the most important dd of leukocoria is retinoblastoma and what i say baby or one and a half year old child with leukocoria 80% of the cases the answer is retinoblastoma so always think about retinoblastoma if they say mother or one and a half year old child coming with leukocoria now this can be unilateral leukocoria or it can be bilateral leukocoria apart from the leukocoria uh, sir this has uh, been one tumor which has a varied varied presentation and many a times baby comes with proptosis we start thinking about cellulitis and uh, we even start doing monitoring thinking right. might be it is it is a case of cavernous sinus thrombosis it is rhabdomyosarcoma rhabdomyosarcoma right. so and uh, suddenly we come to know no it is retinoblastoma so it is one tumor which is i think very very versatile kind and a baby is very very small and usually these children are not usually brought to the opd because the first parents they are very possessive about the babies they don't want to bring the babies and they say 
it is just a whitish reflex and some of the times they may confuse it with the congenital cataract they says ki it's only the cataract and we will bring the baby afterwards but uh, i think uh, there should be a general awareness that whitish reflex uh, government has paid a lot of importance to rop and i think they are not paying that much of importance to the rb and it, it requires that That's like uh, we are uh, telling every pediatrician please send the baby to the uh, ophthalmologist because it is those people who are having the first uh, uh, impression of, impression the, child, of right? the child we are not having the child so similarly as, as if they are doing for rop i think they there should be of some guidelines that whitish reflex should be sent for the screening for the retinoblastoma too now apart from this the secondary glaucomas like buphthalmos that is also very very common though buphthalmos is a separate entity that uh, we usually take it uh, with the congenital malformations in the angle of the anterior chamber the blue baby you know but one of the hidden presentation of retinoblastoma can be glaucoma also now though glaucoma will be usually late because by the time we have that amount of tumor cells that are actually necessary for causing glaucoma it is a late many manifestation but yes if person if the baby is having glaucoma not responding to any other thing you should also keep one possibility that it can be a case of retinoblastoma too along with this there are certain cases where we have iris nodules so a pseudo hypopion kind of condition a pseudo tumor kind of condition a inflammatory kind of condition can also be a presentation and in many cases the child is just coming like orbital inflammation and on first side you cannot say that it is actually a tumor it is just like a orbital cellulitis and we know that the most common cause of unilateral proptosis is actually orbital cellulitis so keeping that in mind we actually admit the baby so i think uh, it should be a uh, one diagnosis which should have a high degree of suspicion it is always better to over diagnose than to under diagnose so any case who is coming even with the inflammation always suspect retinoblastoma and in the severest of the cases it can even come with the orbital invasion see here a uh, major degree of invasion is actually present so if you look at the spreads that is very very important uh the growth pattern of the retinoblastoma it has basically two kinds like endophytic and exophytic so that is a very peculiar pattern that we get when it grows from the retina into the vitreous cavity can you see a very beautiful cottage cheese appearance kind of thing you get and this is also one reason why we are getting the leukocoria or the whitish pupillary reflex while if the growth is exophytic then the retina is the growth is taking the retina towards the choroid and it resembles now this is very very important it resembles a exudative retinal detachment actually it is not a true exudative retinal detachment which actually causes the shifting fluid sign so in the later stages after the orbital extension when it has led to the proptosis there is a stage when it can actually spread through the optic nerve and that is sir the most dangerous aspect once it goes to the optic nerve right. any time it can extend to the brain so i think that is a very very important point and uh, we always try to send the optic nerve biopsy so that you are very very sure that uh, what amount of treatment because our treatment uh, regimen usually depends upon the extent so for that we are actually dependent upon the histopath so i would like you to throw some light on the histopathological aspect so guys the spread was very clear uh, the ma'am told us that there can be hematogenous spread the hematogenous spread can go to the liver and the direct spread which usually occurs via the nerves that is the cranial nerves uh, so the optic nerve can go to the brain as well so often the optic nerve biopsy is taken or the the tumor biopsy can be taken as such and case and we send as a excision or a incision biopsy having said that uh, the basic thing that you often see in retinal blastoma are rosettes now why rosette understand there is i told you it's type of called as primitive neuro ectodermal tumor any pnet and especially the ewing sarcoma will always show you a rosette and that rosette is not this one this is basically a flexner windersian rosette that rosette is often seen as this one well if you remember guys this is called as homer right rosette a homer right rosette is a 
classical image that you see in any sort of peanut, right? So what you see in Homo erectus, look at this pinkish eosinophilic cytoplasm, this one, so this one, there's a pinkish eosinophilic cytoplasm, it is believed to be the nerve secretions, those are called as glial secretions, okay, there may be nerves or maybe a glial cell and around them, these all blue cells you see here, these are the small round blue cells, okay, the small round blue cells. So this type of rosette, which has a eosinophilic cytoplasm in center, is called as Homer right rosettes. However, retinoblastoma may also show you a true rosette that is called as flexner, winter stener rosette. Look at the lumen. It's a very empty lumen here. Had this lumen contain a vessel or this lumen contain a eosinophilic cytoplasm, this would not have been a true rosette. So often I'm asked a question, sir, what is true and what is a pseudo? So suppose you see a cells arranged like this with an empty lumen, let's call this A, and suppose you see a tumor cell arranged like this, and with anything in between, let's have a, let's have this blue color inside it, and let's call this B. The A is a true rosette because it's empty lumen, and the B is a pseudo rosette because it doesn't have an empty lumen. It may be a glial cell, it may be a vessel, it can be anything. So what I want to tell you here is, this rosette, which has an empty lumen, this is a true rosette, and it's called as flexner winter stener rosette. This type of rosette is not, this type of rosette is a true rosette, can also be seen in ependymoma, which is a brain tumor, right? So this is a, again a small round blue cell. So sir, how much importance you will give uh, to this uh, Flexner winter stener rosette? If I say, suppose a baby is coming to me with the leukocoria and I have a lot of DDs with right. the babies having leukocoria and uh, if you tell me that ma'am, we are getting this rosettes on this topet, so are we sure now? No, look ma'am, what happens is retinoblastoma has some cells which are differentiated and some which is undifferentiated. So when a retinoblastoma differentiates, please understand, again I repeat, it's a peanut, primitive neuroectolumal tumor. So basically what happened, there are some primitive nerve cells which are supposed to become nerves, but because of something, it got stopped. That immature cells, they became a tumorous. Hmm. So the cells were actually, were destined to become nerves, but that, yes. that growth pattern was stopped in between. Okay. So what happened, some of the cells became differentiated and some of them remained undifferentiated. So a combination of undifferentiated small round blue cells and a combination of some differentials in the form of rosettes, which gives you a detailed diagnosis, it can be a retinoblastoma. So what I, my point here is, it can be a true rosette, it can be a pseudo rosette, that is true is flexible intestinal. Yes. The Means lumen the in which the lumen. lumen. Empty lumen. Empty lumen. And this one being a homoerite rosette, not yeah. only this, it can show you something called as fluorets. The fluorets is a very interesting thing. You might have seen a bouquet, bouquet of flowers. So the flower, you see this pinkish area. The pink area are basically the eosinophilic, eosinophilic uh, expansion. The cytoplasm, eosinophil cytoplasm, they become so expanded, they become like this flowery arrangement. Look at this flower arrangement. It's looking, it looking like something like this. This pinkish area, had this been a pink area entirely, this would have been a called as fluorets. So combination of flexometer stener, homerite and fluorets, ma'am I can tell you, it will be a retinoblastoma. So means for diagnosis, we should have all the types. All the three types. If only one is there, then no, we no, cannot not like say. That. So there can be some undifferentiated tumor also, which may have just small round blue cells. Only that. Only that. Only that. So yes, we'll put some uh, immunohistochemistries to confirm what is the origin of that uh, okay. gene actually, tumor also. Okay. And for diagnosing this flexner intestinal, like nowadays image-based questions are also very common. Suppose they give one ophthalmology question that this baby is coming with one and a half year old leukocoria and there is calcification and suppose some family is is also there and they say and they give these three then which of the following should be most correlating with the retinoblastoma? For retinoblastoma ke liye, well, I would say that this is the most correlating image that it, is flexner with the then, you, then the students have to go with this, this one, right. and the most diagnostic thing that they have to see is just is the, the empty, empty lumen. lumen. Just by seeing empty lumen yes. they are sure because this is what I used to teach them in the class so I want to be sure that see it is the empty lumen, empty lumen. that by which you can easily differentiate whether it is flexner winter stainer, homerite and the fluorite yeah. also. So, right. And there is something called a pseudo rosette also. Yeah, so what happens? The pseudo rosette, we can say this is a pseudo rosette. This is a pseudo rosette. Because it's a pinkish eosinophilic cytoplasm. Suppose this would have been a vessel. 
okay it would it is a eastern cytoplasm but suppose it would have been a vessel you would call it perivascular pseudo rosettes okay and that was seen in the brain tumor again ependymoma let's not get confused right now so yes. three things you can see a small round blue cells with the three types of uh, rosettes one of them is fluorets second is flexible intestinal rosette and the third one being a homer right rosette but i tell you some retinoblastoma may have a completely undifferentiated origin and may just show you small round blue cells that's it nothing else and even that is uh, helpful for the diagnosis and sufficient with for a good the clinical uh, good clinical uh, history uh, we can definitely tell it with retinoblastoma right okay sir is there any guidelines that you would like to tell us that we should send the histopathology uh, tissue that much because we usually send it on our own we don't know and we try to give it at least 10 mm so that you That's people more than enough that 10 is mm is more than more enough than i think enough. we can get, we usually get less than that but i think 10 mm is a good enough amount of tissue to for a histopathology to uh, to tell the diagnosis especially if there is a differentiation pattern seen there okay so uh, after being uh, understanding the concept of the uh, micropathology now i would like to throw some light on the other investigation things also what we can do see uh, in the beginning obviously we start with the ophthalmoscopy and uh, here unlike the rd we are getting a reddish reflex so the uh, the investigation of choice that is the first thing that we do is actually the b scan ultrasound uh, now b scan ultrasound is usually combined with the a scan ultrasound. sound so uh, along with the b scan you will get the waves also that will help you in correlating and confirming whatever you are getting on the b scan so on one hand we have a brightness scan and on another end we have a a scan that is a amplitude scan brightness now brightness will show you the size that will show you the extent and a is the amplitude that will give you the spike pattern so if you see this b scan ultrasound here you are getting a mass also and along with these you will get small foci because this is a tumor which is known for causing the calcification what is this trophic calcification yes right? so that so i think that is one of the causes of dystrophic yes, calcification right. also so yes so that will show you the foci and these uh, intra lesional uh, calcified areas are actually responsible for giving the typical pattern which is called as vy pattern vy pattern on the a scan because there are certain areas which are hyper dense because they are the areas of the tumor and along with this we get certain hypo dense areas which are the areas of necrosis sir can you tell us why Why actually we get these areas of necrosis also? Uh... So this tumor is a very high vascular tumor. The reason of this is like in in neoplasia, you always tell that where is the tumor is very malignant. Yes. It needs more vessels. And the reason of one of the reason of getting more vessel is a tumor need glucose for proliferation. Mm -hmm. So more a malignant tumor, it would require more and more vessels. Now the what happens is because the tumor is highly proliferating tumor, mm -hmm. some of the area are patchy necrosed. The reason is those area do not get the vessels. Okay. So this tumor has various vessels, but there's some area which will not have vessels, and that area will not get the entire amount of blood supply. It will get obviously ischemic necrosis. Yes, it will start showing the ischemic necrosis. 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 So can we have this direct uh, proportional also that more malignant is the tumor, more are the areas yes, of necrosis? Yes, definitely. It always is true that in neoplasia and malignant tumor, the more malignant tumor, there's more area of necrosis. Okay, so that is indirect way of getting uh, one thing that yes, this tumor is it's more malignant. malignant. It is so highly, highly malignant. Is. If you are getting more and more areas of Y pattern, yes, necrosis. Okay, now the second thing that we can do after the ultrasound is that yes, we can send the baby for the CT scan. But nowadays, actually, we avoid it, especially in the familial retinoblastoma. As sir has told that uh, there are uh, cases where we can have more and more hereditary cases of the retinoblastoma. so we are actually directly sending for the mr so that we can know about the calcification also and the optic nerve involvement because as we both of us are agreeing that the most common route of spread is optic nerve and it can go to the brain so by sending to ct i can just confirm the diagnosis of ultrasound but by sending for mr i am getting not only calcification i can also get the optic nerve involvement and so that we can plan what to do next along with this 
this we can also go for the plasma ldh activity now again a important thing this is not diagnostic it is just for the prognostic levels so if you are getting very high levels then we can actually have this high plasma ldh activity or after the treatment also i can again go for the plasma ldh levels to see they should actually come down after this so how sir this plasma ldh activity it, it is be a correlated marker, uh, is a tumor marker of any sort of small round blue cell even having sarcoma has the same uh, plasma ldh activity which is a good very good tumor marker and as you all know friends tumor marker is only used for screening tests used for looking for recurrence it will never help you in confirmatory diagnosis but yes it will definitely help in prognostication and looking for recurrence of tumor after tumor has been excised okay so after going through the clinical aspect the genetics aspect the histopathological aspect finally we come to the treatment of the tumor in a way we have to treat it so looking at the boundaries uh, as uh, we mentioned that it is like a real estate so age location that is actually important for the tumors so if it is unilateral tumor and just less than 10 mm then we can go for the tumor destructive therapy just focus on the tumor and not on the eye so there we can use the photocoagulation the cryotherapy brachytherapy now please don't use all of them just go for one of them now which one to choose ma'am it depends upon the surgeon's convenience it depends upon the hospital like uh, what is the facility that is available and what is the surgeon experience uh, is having so if he is more convenient in laser he can go for that also sometimes the hospital does not have the cryotherapy then also we can go for laser so it actually depends upon the patient the services as well as the surgeon himself so either of the three he can take but usually we get the large size tumors because as i told you in indian setup we are not getting babies very very early so usually it is more than 10 mm and i don't want to take the risk because i know because uh, that bilateral tumors are pretty pretty common so i want to save this eye so what i will go for the enucleation and whenever we do enucleation we always try to remove a uh, larger size of the optic nerve so that we can send the tissue for the histopath for the confirmation and one thing is that as sir told that there is always a risk of osteosarcoma in right. these babies so what i want to uh, get this that we should actually tell the patient also that the life long surveillance is actually required in these babies it is not just 10 years 14 years 35 years it is the life long surveillance because any time they can actually develop the osteosarcoma and for the bilateral tumors obviously we have to go for the chemotherapy this was a direct question that was asked in need 2019 to that which drugs should be given for retinoblastoma so it is vincristine it Etoposide. Now these are the two things that you always know. What get confusion is the carboplatin. So it is not cisplatin. It is not chlorambucil. C stands for the carboplatin. That is a very very important point. And the life log surveillance that I have said that is that should not be underrated. You have to uh, keep this baby for the life long surveillance, and you have to knock them. Uh, we have not started this in India, but in developed countries they have uh, started. maintaining the records and like uh, we get the uh, calls for insurance whenever it is due uh, from the service centers they actually send a call to the patient i think that is a very recommendable thing that we should start in india also and after every 5 years or so they actually call the patient like you should bring that baby for the surveillance so i think that's a very very important step that we can also start and this is a small international classification that we use for the intraocular retinoblastoma so, so uh, sir uh, we try to divide it into five groups like uh, the a b c d and e and usually i tell the students not to actually rectify it you can just uh, uh, go through it so that you have this thing in the mind that uh, how and on what basis we are actually dividing it so first thing as i told you that the size is important so the small ones are 3 mm so we are starting with the 3 mm and extent extent that is the location so first the size size is 3 mm and if they are confined just to the retina or the inner aspect optic disc that is group a now if it is Uh, beating both the things if it is more than 3 and it is not within the limits of the optic disc and retina then it is group c now 
when it is extending how much area it is extending so that will give you c dne so if it is well defined and the spread now the important thing is the spread so if the spread is under the retina that whenever the spread is under the retina we use the term sub retinal seedling and when it is filling the eye that is vitreous so just remember well defined uh, whether it is uh, within the vitreous or it is within the retina so that is your vitreous seedlings or the sub retinal seedlings and then d we are going to the poorly defined and now they are having more and more amount of seedling and finally the last which is causing the pressure atrophy it is causing glaucoma always remember the last stage means the complication so whenever tumor is actually coming with the complication that is actually the group e so i think now we have come up to the uh, final stages of our integrated video sir i would request you to tell uh, some last uh, uh, take away messages what they should remember in your nuts and uh, hypothesis that will help them in solving the mcq instantaneously so right uh, let's uh, let's have a small revision of this what happens the retinal blastoma is coming from a neuronal it's a progenitor cell right number one second it comes because of mutation of a, a proliferator gene that is called as tumor suppressor gene it is called as rb gene this rb gene is on chromosome number 13 long arm 13 q now, when this RB gene is having a loss of the alleles, both the alleles, the tumor happens. In sporadic cases, the zygote is normal and two mutations occurs after the uh, birth. But in femoral cases, one of the mutation occurs at the zygote stage and the second mutation occurs after the zygote stage. That becomes a tumor. Okay. Now, uh, recently that there are some infections which are uh, thought to be also cause causing the RB gene mutation. One of them is a polymovirus, it's a semen virus 40 and the human papillomavirus. So, if you remember guys, what I told you was RB gene has an E2F pocket, right? So, this G, these infections, they go and bind to the E2F pocket. The E2F pocket, that E2F becomes free and can cause cell proliferation. This might be another, other, another question that which infection can cause a RB gene mutation. Remember these infections. Uh, thirdly, uh, understand the bilaterality cases. That is more bilateral in the female cases and less of that in the sporadic cases. But uh, overall, the bilateral cases are 25 to 40 percent. Then you should understand the diagnosing point and as ma'am said, you should go for retino, retina scan. Uh, you will also go for the biopsy pattern. The biopsy will see the uh, three most important things. That is the rosette, flexner, intestinal rosette. You will see a home or right rosettes and the fluorets, right? But I tell you, there may be case where there's just small round blue cells and nothing else. The treatment part, uh, let's summarize it ma'am. Yes, so the treatment part, three important things. Either you go for the tumor destructive therapy. If you, if you feel like that it is within the limits and it is well controllable and there is no risk of spreading to the other eye go for the tumor destructive therapy if it looks like that it is now beyond our limits we cannot save the eye better to go for enucleation and the third is chemotherapy for the all the other categories it can be metastatic it can be bilateral extending to the optic nerve and causing the complications so i hope uh, you people will gain a lot of um, valuable information from these integrated videos and we really want you to comment and tell us that how did you like the video and how did you gain the information because we are really working hard and lot of efforts we are putting in to bring these integrated videos in front of you so uh, i think that uh, a positive feedback will uh, rather encourage us in uh, bringing more such integrated videos in front of you and also tell us what topics you all want us to for integration in future thank you and bye-bye thank you thank you sir